Hey there, so I had a free Saturday and I thought that I would create a video based on a simple arcade game, in this case Snake. Um, now in this video I'm actually going to go through an object oriented approach to creating the Snake game. Um, because I think on my channel so far I've gone through all of the basics of object oriented programming and act oriented programming, but I haven't actually shown developing an application. So in this video, I'm going to go through creating this snake game using OOP and I'll show you some of the tools that I use in order to design the snake game. So, let's have some fun. Ah, oh, no. Instead of diving straight into developing code, I'm actually gonna start off with documentation. And to help us out with documentation, I'm going to install the NIGOOP uh, toolkit. So in uh, JKI VI Package Manager, if you search for OOP in your chosen version of LabVIEW, then oh, there seems to be two versions here. Uh, I think the later one would be good for us. If you download the NIGOOP development suite and install that, this toolkit allows you to document your classes in UML, so Unified Modeling Language, and show, hey, so class A is related to class B by inheritance. You could also show relations by composition and usage as well. And the best thing is, after you've created your diagram, you can generate your classes and they'll appear in your LabVIEW project. So I'm qu typically quite a lazy developer. I don't want to be creating all of these classes from scratch, having to right click, new, class, give it a name, fill out methods. I can tell the UML diagram what methods I want and what data I want and the relationship between classes. That's all done for me. So once this is installed, let's open it up, have a brainstorm about this class relationship and hopefully we'll have a snake game at the end of this video. Now that the tool's been installed and I've restarted LabVIEW, um, I've created a new project called Snake Game. And if you don't see the tool on your toolbar here, just extend your project and you'll see these new uh, Goop toolkits. This is a toolkit which I've used quite a few times before. However, I didn't have it installed for 2015, hence having to install it earlier. And I wanted to make this project in 2015 so I could distribute it uh, to you so you can have a go um, at what I made at home. You can also I know, change what I do. You can challenge my design decisions um, and leave those in the comments. To get started, let's click on this icon here, open UML modeler. So about will take a few seconds, oh, it's already there. And we're greeted with a blank canvas where we can drop down anything we want. Now I've been thinking about this snake game and I think I'm going to have four classes. I'm going to have a look at the game components. So we'll have a fruit class, a snake class, and a game board class. And if we think about those in terms of objects, the snake and the fruit are going to be on the game board. So we're going to have something called containment there. So the game board has a snake and it has some fruit. And that snake needs to be able to move independently and the fruit needs to appear in random positions. However, it's the game board that should decide and display the snake and the fruit. Using this tool is super easy. So I'm not going to go into all of the details of how to use the tool. I highly recommend you download it for yourself and you just give it a go. In the worst case scenario and you manage to break it, it's fine, just reinstall it. Uh, the very basics though, we click on class up here, we can place down a class and if we double click it, give the class a name, let's say game components, we can give that some attributes, so some private data, and the game components, every component is going to have a colour, so let's call it colour and a colour in LabVIEW is actually an unsigned int32 or a colour box constant. So uint32, there we go. And we can click OK. Some methods, we could get colour, add method, set colour, just 
basic accessors to set and get and click OK. We could create another class such as the snake itself. So let's place down a class, double click. We could give some attributes here such as direction and that can be a simple integer. Click OK and then add methods such as uh, change direction or move forwards. So, so let's say move forwards. Now that snake is going to be on a game board. So let's place down that game board. Um, either we could fill out some attributes uh, later on such as score count and methods would be increment score, move snake or update snake, place fruit or create fruit etc. Click OK. So now I want to show you about class relationships here. So snake, game board and actually fruit which is another class will all inherit from game components. So let's go on to um, inheritance and I'm going to say that the snake will inherit from game components. The same as game board will inherit from game components. Now there's another thing here where we're going to have some composition where the game board has a snake. Hmm. Thinking about it in future why don't we make it so the game board could have multiple snakes. So you could have multiplayer snake. I'll probably leave that to you for a later day. Um, but that's called composition. So let's go on to composition or composite aggregation and say that the game board has a snake and we can add that as an attribute. So now the game board has a snake as its private data. So now I'm going to go away and just complete this class diagram and then get back to you. All right, I'm pretty sure I finished this now. So what I've done, I've got four classes here, game components, game board, snake and fruit. A game board has snake and fruit. So you've got composition uh, going into the game board and those three classes inherit from uh, game components, which has a color. I've also added some association just to say, hey, the main VI is associated with game board, snake and fruit. Um, I also added some uh, type definitions, well one type def called coordinates x and y because I figured we're going to have to coordinate the snake and the fruit on the game board. I also created an enum for direction so up, down, left and right instead of relying on raw keyboard uh, codes. So I'm going to show you something a bit magical now if we head over to tools, and I hope this works, head over to tools and then generate code from UML. So let's select that. Uh, select project to our classes to. Well, it's picked up that I have snake game project here. A uh, class provider to use. I'm actually just going to use the native uh, LabVIEW class here. Um, and then it gives me some options such as color scheme um, etc. Now I'm not actually a fan of the colour schemes that they choose so I'll create the code and then I'll change the icons uh, manually. But let's click OK and shall see what happens. Oh, okay so we've already got one class, two classes there but notice how from this documentation we're creating code and remember that documentation is super important. I know it's the boring bit but at least here all of the documentation is done up front and we can use the documentation to create our code. With this tool you can actually create your code and then reverse engineer the documentation as well. So I've used that a couple of times but of course it's best to document, design your systems and then create code from it. The tool's finished its scripting so let's have a look at what's actually been created. So immediately we see there are four classes, fruit, game board, game components and snake. Did we expand these? Yep, you see we have our class members. So fruit here have an initialize and a cleanup. The tool provides us with an initialize and a cleanup without you specifying it. So I'll probably get rid of those actually. Um, 
but notice how all of the methods are there. And do remember I specified a type def of uh, coordinates. So if we open this up, you can, you can see it's being listed as a type def, just X and Y. And we also had direction as well. Up, down, left and right. Perfect. However, notice that it's put both of those type defs in the snake class. However, because fruit also has direction, uh, sorry, coordinates, um, I'm actually going to move that type def outside of the snake class and have it as global data. Um, I'm also going to change a lot of these icons because if you have a look at the objects, they're not descriptive of what they actually are, such as snake and fruit here, as well as the game board. So I'm going to quickly change those, change it to how I like. But important takeaway here is everything you see here was created for us by the scripting tool. So or we could just go ahead and code straight away. I'm just being pedantic. I went away and made some uh, changes such as moving the type defs outside of the snake class. I changed various icons as well. Um, I also made uh, a main VI, which hasn't been populated yet. So now let's actually think about how this game is going to operate. So I was thinking we should have probably two loops. One loop looking for uh, WASD or up, down, left and right uh, directions. And we'll have another loop that's actually updating the game board itself. Um, speaking of which, on the front panel, I was going to have a 2D array of color box constants. So let's place down a classic color box. And I quite like using the classic color boxes because they're so basic, they're very easy to optimize. And let's call this a pixel. I'll make that invisible and change to an array. I'll make that a 2D array and span that out. So now, good, we have a game console. Well, all of these individual pixels could be the background, it could be a tail, it could be a piece of fruit, and a piece of fruit could be blue, let's say, and the snake could be purple. So as our snake progresses along, each pixel will change color. Well, actually, no, the head of the snake will change color and the tail will change to the background. And so we can have the effect of the snake moving along. And then as the snake moves along and captures fruit, we want the score to increment. So let's put down a score indicator here and change this to be uh, did we make it a U32? Cool. Let's reinitialize this to default values. Have a look at the block diagram. Actually, I'll rename that to be board. We can create this as an indicator. So we have score and board. They're going to reside within inside a loop. And we're going to have an event-driven loop as well to monitor uh, W for up, S for down, A for left, D for right. So let's put that down. And configure this for a uh, key down. Based on the character down, we want to say go up, down, left or right. So let's place down a case structure. So I had a little play of this and found out that the WASD keys related to um, 97, 115, 119 and 100 and I worked that out just by placing an indicator and pressing the buttons. Inside each case I've put whether the snake should go up, down, left or right using the direction type def that was created for us and to transfer this direction up to the top loop I'm actually going to use something called a single element queue. So that's a standard queue that you find in the queue palette here, the queue operations palette. However, with inside obtain queue, you might not have noticed, but there's a max queue size on top, and I'm going to set that to one. So that means there can only be one element in the queue. Now you might be thinking, well, why don't you just use a notifier? Because a notifier only has the latest element. 
However, with a single element Q, you can essentially have a locking mechanism. So once you NQ an element, that Q is then locked until you DQ that element. So you can't push in elements to a Q that's already full. In this particular scenario, I don't know if that's going to be helpful to us yet. However, I like to plan ahead and have an, an SE cube instead of a notifier for situations like this. Um, I would use a way to broadcast uh, some messages to multiple loops, but here it's a one-to-one -one communication. So let's create our single element Q by placing a one in there. And I'm actually gonna put down a lossy NQ because if we type keys really quickly, uh, we probably only want the latest um, key. So let's place down a lossy NQ, and wire that up, and wire up our data type as well. Okay, so now let's have a think about dequeuing this element. Well, even with a single element queue, we could just dequeue normally. So we'll dequeue up here, like so. And depending on the direction that comes out of here, we might modify the snake's behavior to start enqueuing elements in, or enqueuing tail elements in a different order, perhaps. However, before we go too far down this route, let's make sure we can stop our design pattern correctly. I'll create an indicator here so we can monitor that everything's working. Um, but let's send a message from this top loop down to the event structure to stop the VI from running. Um, I will do that with a, a user event. Okay, so now if I run this, I W for up, so we see up, down, left, and right as we expect. Now if we click stop, okay, it hasn't stopped straight away, and that's because we're waiting for an element to occur, so if we give it an element, you can see that we stopped our uh, structures. So now we have our basic code modules here, so the methods and classes, and we have the design pattern. Let's start merging those together. So in this section of the code, I want to initialize our classes. So let's now initialize a brand new board. And because it's object oriented, I know that the game board, well, we want to make a new game board. And initialize game board, I've actually completed the functionality for, but if we have a look inside of it, I'm saying, okay, what's the grid size going to be? So by default, I've said 30 by 30 pixels. We have a color box constant. So what's the default background color going to be? And then I initialize a 2D array of X by Y, so 30 by 30. And that 2D array creates our game board. A game board is just a simple 2D array of uh, U32s or color box constants. And notice here, I have a method for our parent class, which is game components. And all that is, is a writer to the class private data. If I do control shift E, we can see that's one of our protected methods in game components. I'll oh, just close that. I will give it some controls and indicators. So I'll right click, create a constant, create constant. And the nice thing about this is I can very easily change the colors of my background. Uh, the next thing we do, uh, let's add a snake to our board. So for a snake, I need to initialize our snake. And I've chosen to say, okay, our snake how many starting elements should our snake have? Should it just be a single pixel that moves around? Or should it be maybe three pixels that move to give a starting snake? Um, like before, we have a snake color and a starting direction. And let's have a look at the functionality here as well. So ultimately, I'm just setting up our class private data. And I do 
control space, control shift D um, to create these constants. Actually, this left here, let's y back from our SEQ. Which, thinking about it, I could have just used uh, a notifier. Okay. Perfect. And let's make this nice and neat. Next, that snake needs to be onto the game board. So in true object-oriented fashion, we have a method called add snake. So if we go to a game board, add snake. Because I'm saying I just want to add a snake to the game board. Um, oh, so this is a method which I haven't uh, completed. So let's uh, do that now. I'm going to just create some data. I'll delete this. Um, so what I want to do is put this snake in the centre of the board. So that means I need to find out what the board size is. So I'm going to look at the game board and then... Oh, here's a quick tip. Um, you can actually use the matrix size to get the coordinates of a 2D array. So if I do matrix size for a 2D array, I get number of rows and number of columns. So as an alternative, I could do array size, and that would then give me an array of sizes. But for a 2D array, you can just use the matrix. So from this array size, I want to go, I want to put this snake in the center of the board. Um, and actually I've created a method just to encapsulate some of this functionality and make it all much neater called generate snake or generate here. So what generate is going to do, you can see it's quite involved here, but I get those coordinates of X and Y, I then divide it by two. Um, and again, just another quick tip, if you're dividing by two, remember that in binary, you're just moving the decimal point along by one. Because in binary, it's base two, so it doubles every number you go up, so to divide by two, just move the decimal place along. Which is why I'm using the function scale by power of two, which simply bit shifts, essentially. Um, so, I now have element 15 and 15. I then want to say, okay, if I have five starting elements and I'm heading left as my starting direction, I want to have my five elements, one, two, three, four, five. If I was going up, I'd want to have my elements one, two, three, four, five, etc. So I'm so my elements are always pointing towards the left. So I start building on the right. And I do that just by creating an array of coordinates. That array of coordinates can then be put into two class attributes of the snake tail. So if I open up this, we have a 1D array of snake tail coordinates. And I also say, okay, what's the head coordinate going to be? Because we're going to be using the head coordinate quite a bit. And the head coordinate is quite simply the very first element. So I just index the array for the first element. Okay, so to create this uh, snake, let's create a control. I need to know what the coordinates are, so I'm going to create a constant because I want to know what the array size is, because it won't always be 30 by 30. So we bundle by name here. Yeah. And actually it's going to be y then x. Okay, so now we have the ability to generate a snake in the center of the board. 
So this function here will generate the coordinates and it will start those coordinates from the center of the board. Now we actually need to place those pixels into the game board. So to do that, I have a method called replace elements. So replace board pixel. And this is going to replace individual pixels. And I'll put that inside an auto indexing uh, for loop. So for every element in this snake tail, so if I look for output snake coordinates, remember that these need to be shift registers so we don't lose any uh, data. I also need to decide what color these pixels should now be. So I'm going to use the get color vi, wire that into my snake, or that's set color, let's get color, wire that into my snake in color. And the very last thing I need to do is actually give the game board the snake class, well, the snake object itself. Okay, so now we've actually added the snake to the game board. We have generated the snake, given it some length, and added it to the game board. Let's make sure we wire our connector pane and let's make that required. Okay, so now we can wire that up. Perfect, let's initialize some fruit now. So go to fruit, uh, new fruit, and we'll give the fruit a default color, create constant, and let's yeah, just have a, some red fruit. And then in our game board, we can add fruit. So add fruit class, like so. And if we have a look at the method for add fruit class, all it is is putting the fruit object into the class private data. I suppose whilst we're doing this, we should propagate our errors through. Okay, so now we've added the fruit, we need to place the fruit let's go to the place fruit method and put place fruit down. Place fruit is going to pick a random number somewhere on this grid. So a random number between the no maximum number of rows and columns. So we're using this little piece of code to get a random number between two values. And actually if we were using 2019 LabVIEW, there's a function that does this for us. And we're going to say if these coordinates are equal to the snake tail, do the loop again. And we're going to go around this loop until we pick a location that isn't connected to this tail. And like the snake, we're going to replace this board element, but because a piece of fruit is only one pixel, we just replace one element. So let's save that and wire this in. Okay, let's just see what we have so far. So I'm going to look at the game board. So get game board and wire that to our front panel and save. And let's just look to see what we have. Okay, we're seeing all green. Uh, all these pixels are quite big, so it's probably just not showing all of the pixels. Let's make them a bit smaller and make this board a bit bigger. There we go, there's our snake. There we go, so there's our snake. And if we run this again, notice how the snake was in the same place, but the fruit moved because it was a different random number. Let's run it again and see it moved all the way up there. Now we've been able to prove that we can create this board, we can create a snake, we can create a piece of fruit and put those all together and display on the user interface. 
we're not actually that far away from a finished product. Well, okay, I shouldn't have said that. There's still quite a bit to do. But in essence, we only have to find out what direction we're going and tell the snake which direction to go. So we can encapsulate this functionality into a method for our snake. We need to move the snake. And I'm thinking we can rotate the tail array by one. So by rotating the array, we mean move the array along by one and then replace that dead element with the new head. Um, what else do we need to do? We need to see if, as we've moved, if that move is valid. So if we've hit a wall or we've hit our tail, that's not a valid move and it's game over. We also need to see if we hit a piece of fruit. And if we hit a piece of fruit, we increment the score by one you then have to place a new piece of fruit. So it's quite logical. And in true object-oriented style, we've created methods that do all those stages. So in our game board, let's have a look for redirection, which is here. And let's populate this. So we're going to be reading direction from this queue here. So I'm going to create a control and cut that and paste that down here. So let's call that direction SEQ, single element queue and align that. Ooh. Okay, now I'm thankful that we actually used a single element queue here instead of the notifier because I can now use the function preview queue element without taking that element out of the queue. Because let's say after a couple of iterations, I haven't pressed a keyboard shortcut, that element is still going to be in the queue. So the last element enqueued will stay in the queue until I override it or overwrite it. Cool, so this isn't well made there. I now need to tell the snake what direction this is. So let's go to snake and set the snake direction. Perfect. And inside here, this is just a, an accessor, sorry, a data accessor. So I write the data here. Let's unbundle and bundle this snake. Let's bundle that up. There is a shortcut to allow us to do this, but I don't have it installed in um, 2015, annoyingly. Direction. Perfect, so we're reading that single element queue and if the user hasn't updated that value, that's absolutely fine because we're not taking out that element, we are just previewing it. Let's add this to our connector pane and make this required. Just on a side note, do you systematically go through and make sure things are set as required? Um, a lot of developers choose not to or they don't really think about whether it's required, optional or recommended. However, when developing an API and when we do object oriented programming, we are simply creating these APIs. It's really important to tell your user if something must be wired or whether the function would work without it being connected. Okay, so let's wire this up. So our SEQ down here, I will delete that. I'll delete this for, for now. And so let's move that snake by updating it on the board and wire that up. So what we're doing inside this method is outputting two clusters of what the new head is and what the new tail is. So the new head, I want to change color to the snake color and the deleted tail, I want to change to the background color. So I'm only changing two pixels on the whole game board. So instead of refreshing the entire array of pixels, I'm only updating two pixels, the new head and the deleted part of the tail. And so we have a cluster of coordinates here and we have the replace board element here and here. 
and we're replacing that board element with the snake color for the new head and the background board color for the end of the let's have a look at the functionality with inside move snake so again i've already created the functionality for this method um, by the way when i show you code instead of creating it live before you it's because i've attempted to make it live before you but i've messed up so many times in recording i've just given up and that happens quite a lot so anyway in this method we're finding out where the snake should be if we're moving forwards the next pixel should be directly ahead of us if we're moving left the next pixel should be to the left of us right and backwards so with that in mind i'm taking the current front of the snake which is element zero and then if i'm going right I'm adding one to the X coordinate. So X is choosing which column I'm going in. So if I add one to X, I move to the right. If I'm going up, I subtract one from my Y value. So I go up, um, left and down are equal but opposite. So now I know where I should be next. However, instead of dynamically creating a new memory space I'm actually going to use the same memory location that my array was using because I'm not adding or removing array elements I'm just changing them so that's why I'm rotating the array here so the last value of this array is becoming the first value and I'm going to replace that first value with the value we calculated here I then use the replace array subset so I can be as efficient as possible when manipulating this array. We then update the tail direction and head values. And then we'll move on to the next task, which is determining whether or not our new position is valid or not. Before we check to see if our position is valid, let's just double check what we've done so far is correct. To do that, we need to maintain the current status of the board, i.e. current uh, board layout, the, the snake, etc. So I'll just make this into a shift register, save that, and we'll need a wait function as well. Let's see how 200 milliseconds looks. So now when we run this, yep, our fruit has appeared. And when I click ASDW, I'm able to move the snake around. So that's, this is quite satisfying is quite pleasing um, however we haven't done any checks to see if the snake is valid or not so I can go off the board here in fact my snake isn't long enough to go into myself yeah but if I go backwards <laughs> you can see I can do things like that go through myself if I pick up this piece of fruit it will change color but a new piece of fruit won't be added so we need to fix something like that. Right, I'm already having far too much fun. Let's do some more lab view. So let's check to see if that move was valid. To check the validity of the board, I've created a method called board failure. Now on the UML diagram we saw earlier, uh, this will be called is snake on board. Um, however, I just renamed it here. So if you download the code and the UML diagram, I'll have on the GitHub page, uh, they might be called different things. So if we have a look at board failure here on the block diagram, all I've done is check, hey, what's the current size of the board? And is my snake head outside of those boundaries? Notice how I'm only checking where the snake head is. I don't need to check for the other parts of the snake body because the head is the only new component. So only that needs to be checked. I also check here if the tail has been struck. So essentially, if the snake has moved into itself. So let's have a look at tail strike. So in tail strike, I'm using split array to check where the head position is, this wire here, and comparing that to the rest of the positions. And that will give a boolean cluster, which I then need to compare. And if this is false, the tail hasn't been hit. But if it comes out true, because they are equal, the tail has been hit. 
Okay, let's put this onto our main piece of code and wire that up. And instead of this stop button, if we have a fa failure, let's just stop this loop. Oh, that's a wiggly wire. All right, I'll live. So if we run this now and I can go up, I may as well get this piece of fruit and just go straight into the wall. I should now stop the VI. Okay, so our VI hasn't stopped. Let's have a think about why. Okay, you see some troubleshooting in action here. Okay, well, first thing I've noticed is that this generate user event doesn't have any data flow. So let's abort that and wire that up like so. I'll quickly try this again and just go straight into a wall. Perfect. I'm glad that stopped. Right, on to the next task, which um, let's start playing around with some fruit. So we've seen if the board is valid or not. Let's see if we've now eaten some fruit. It's just occurred to me there are only four functions left to do, so I may as well do them in quick succession. They are to see if the fruit has been caught or not. If the fruit has been caught, we need to uh, make the snake's tail longer. We need to place a new item of fruit and we need to increment the score. And incrementing the score reminded me that we need to display the score as well. So there are our four functions. Quite simply, to see if the fruit has been caught, well, let's just see if two clusters are equal. The get head and the get position. Clusters, see if they're equal. If so, the fruit has been caught. That was really nice and straightforward. Next, we want to make the tail longer. Now, this might sound like it's going to be complicated, but the solution is so simple. I'm just going to make the function grow by inserting a new element into the array. So I'm inserting a new element at index one. Really, it could be any element apart from the first or last element in the snake. We could place some fruit, and we actually saw this function earlier, so we're reusing code here, um, where you place a random piece of fruit on the screen between some bounds, and making sure it's not on the tail as well. Lastly, I want to increment score. Score equals score plus one. Nice and straightforward. Um, even get score. It's just going to output the score. So all very straightforward. What could possibly go uh, wrong? Hmm. Right, let's quickly wire these up. Okay, that's all wired. Let's hopefully have a game of snake. So if you run this, cool. I'm incrementing. Let's okay. Score of one and a new piece of fruit has been placed. Nice. I have a good feeling about this. Hopefully, oh, I went the wrong way. Perfect. And I went into all. It stopped. I got a score of four. Let's see if I can build up a bit of tail length in then run into myself. Okay, so the tail did get longer there by one pixel. And again, just as a bonus question, in the comments let me know which function would I change if I wanted to run the snake into one side of the wall if then it reappear in the other side. Okay, so my snake is now uh, quite long. I've got seven extra elements. Let's see if I can run into myself. Oh, okay. So here's a bug. I was able to... <laughs> Do you see that? I'm still able to run into myself. So let's find out why and troubleshoot that. That's annoying. I thought we were done. Okay, so board fail. Let's go into here and have a look at tail strike. All right, with fresh eyes, I immediately see what the issue is. I'm essentially comparing two arrays to see if they're identical or not. That's not what I want to happen. I actually want to be comparing 
a single element to an array and see if that element is equal to any other element, the second array. So all I should need to do is index this array and this top array should only have one element in it because I'm splitting this array just before the first element, i.e. the zeroth element. So let's save that, head back to the game board. Okay, so the board has stopped there. Let's try that again. Okay, and it's stopped uh, for the second time. Now, this brings me on to a whole separate chapter of things of unit testing. Um, if you haven't heard of unit testing before, let me know in the comments or reach out to me and I could do a video on unit testing. Essentially what unit testing would allow me to do or test driven design and development would allow me to do is catch bugs like this as I'm developing the code. So here I've essentially waited until I have a working product. However with unit testing or test driven design and development I would be testing for these edge cases as developing code and I would be able to solve them immediately without having to get to the end of product development in then realising the bugs. Or worst of all, your customer finding the bugs if then you have to deal with it post release. Yeah. Anyway, this particular bug I think is solved. I hope you enjoyed watching me make this game. I quite enjoy making games like this and this snake game is by far finished. There are things which I should have included, like the ability to pause the game, the ability to make the game speed up as we get more and more points. Um, I know that some snake games have uh, wild fruit that appears where you can get bonus points. And they are all things that we could add with this object-oriented architecture. There were some design decisions here which I'm not overly pleased with, um, however, like, feel free to download the code, it's all going to be available on my GitHub page. You can download the code, you can download the UML diagram, um, and let me know what improvements you make to this code. Also, let me know in the comments what type of things you want to see me make uh, in the future. Well, it's really difficult to try and play Snake in your peripheral uh, whilst talking to camera. But I hope you appreciate it. As always, please like, comment and subscribe. And I'll see you again soon. Duh. Ah. Wahee.